Good afternoon, I'm Guillaume Marien, Director of System Engineer for uh, Maru Networks in Canada. I've been uh, with Maru roughly five and a half years, and uh, we want to talk uh, a little bit today about 802.11ac and, and some other feature. The title doesn't say, but uh, I'll touch a little bit on some new feature like the Bonjour protocol that we've incorporated in all our product. So, uh, we all know that the channel are becoming wider and wider, and there's a requirement for more bandwidth, just like Ethernet went from 10 megabit to 100 to gigi, well, we're doing the same thing with 802.11ac, and I'm sure all of you know more about 802.11ac than I know myself, so we're not gonna spend time educating you on that. But what we know is that now the channel in the wave one will be of 80 megahertz, and eventually wave two will go and eventually use 160 megahertz. So if we look at the channel available in Europe and in US, uh, 40 megahertz, 80, and 160, we realize that even at 80 megahertz, which is the current release of 802.11ac product, in, in, including the FS, you might have four channels, but if you exclude the FS, you only have two. And in Europe, it's even worse, they only have one channel to work with. So as the channel becomes wider, we have to realize that single channel architecture almost becomes something that you have no choice, right? At 160, you have to use DFS to even have one channel. Oh, so, sorry, I'm gonna have to that's, that's wrong? completely on that. Okay, <coughs> maybe. You, it doesn't make it ECA have to be just because you're using it. Oh, I'm not saying it has to be. You're, you're correct. I'm just saying it, it makes a case. Oh. It makes a case that single channel actually has some value, right? So you're absolutely right. It's, it's not one or the other. I agree absolutely with you. But it makes a good case. Actually, I would contend that single channel inherent problems are actually exacerbated by the move to 80 megahertz, that you would be better off using single channel with 20 megahertz channels could be and and testing over time will we'll tell absolutely so uh, I'm sure we'll we'll have a, a lot of different numbers that will come out and some more testing will be done so if we move with that of course you could do the multi-channel and but then you're limited in how the amount of channel you have but you might have a case where hey maybe 20 megahertz channel it, it makes more sense but you have to realize that if you go from 80 megahertz down to some 40 megahertz channel, you do lose on capacity. Instead of doing 1.3 gig download at the data rate side, you are now down at 600 megabits. So that's a 50% reduction of available capacity to the client. So again, our mobile flax architecture, um, we believe works very well in those play. We can still do the single channel architecture at full 80 megahertz uh, wide and we can even do the channel layering approach because we could definitely support 280 megahertz channel on the same AP, you know, if, if whatever you need to do. It offers a nice migration path, especially for existing Maru customers that are using single channel already. So you might have an existing AP320s, for example, that is using the 2.4 for your BYOD, you might have a 5 gig spectrum already used for N at 40 megahertz, but then you overlay in high density or high bandwidth requirement area of your building, you can overlay now an AP832, which is our AC product that, that you have in front of you sitting on the table, and uh, you can in deploy a full 80 megahertz channel in the Uni3 band in North America and have still a 40 megahertz for another AC channels on top of or in the neighborhood of this first five gig channel. So it is an easy migration path, and customer uh, are gonna be very pleased, I believe, to, to be able to migrate that easily by overlaying AC, and still have 100% of the benefit of AC in keeping all your legacy client. Because a lot of you realize and have blogged in the past about how the client, the legacy client, has a, such a bad influence on, on the newer network. As much as it's compatible, it does impact the overall well, throughput. With 11 AC though, they have the frame by frame ability to actually change the, the width of the channel. So if, uh, if an 80 megahertz channel is detecting a client that's only capable of 40 megahertz, it's added to 11N, it's going to change its channel width and drop down to using that on its primary channel. Absolutely. To talk to it. So it's not actually a huge concern, I think. Well, to maybe that aspect, you, you might appreciate this next slide. So, Can uh, you go back to yeah. one slide? Sure. Your slides so far have these big disks. Mm -hmm. mm. How many APs are in the disks? 
Depending on how large your network so, is. So this picture then is four radios. All well, actually here, yeah, it's four radios, but you could actually have 20 APs here. So you have 20 APs down there and 20 50, APs up there, yep. whatever the number was. Yep. So to get this plan, you have to have four radios at every location. Well, what, what I was so you have describing. Four single channel layers. You might. What I was describing here is that you have an existing network in a legacy, let's say a school, right? They, all, they have installed that five years ago. Of Maru. Of Maru, or it could be okay. non Maru, right? I mean, we coexist, and I'll show in the next well, slide how well. Well, wouldn't have disks then. They, they might be using more channel, but we can still play nicely with, with neighbors, right? That's how the standard is, is designed. So they installed that three years ago, and now they want to have uh, an 802.11 AC network. So it's a perfect migration by just overlaying additional APs in one, two, or wherever the location they need. So it might not be as big as their, let's say they have a thousand APs like that. They might just install 20 in a, I don't know, a, a I mean, high school. Your, your pictures with these flat disks are look low volume. You don't actually see that there's 20, 40, or 200 APs inside each of those disks. They, they could be. I mean, I have universities that, oops, sorry. I have university that has uh, 3,000 APs on the, on the single disk, right? A single channel. And, and school division, most for the most part. I think it's, it, it's, it's, it seems misleading to me because I'm used to seeing disks as being a single AP, AP yeah, that's coverage right. yeah. area rather no, I, I, than I the channel being like, you know how they make cakes out of cupcakes? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's that's, good. that's the difference. That's good. That, that, my, my point is just it's confusing. Yes. Yeah. It, it, you're, it, it makes it look simpler than it actually yes. is. Mm. It makes it look simpler? Or cheaper. Well, I actually, when talking you know, about RF engineering and proper best practice exists whether you're deploying any kind of network, right? It, it doesn't matter what kind of tools you put into. You have to understand the RF. You have to understand those tools, but, and, and it's the same thing. just hidden the fact that you just had a doubling of all of your APs with a doubling of the switch ports and a doubling of the cable and a doubling of the PoE drops. But if you want to go to AC and you have a legacy network, you have to forklift and replace and, and change your wiring infrastructure for the most part and et cetera. And so. the forklift is different than duplicate. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm not saying that you have to, right? I mean, if you just want to rip and replace, do it. I'm saying that me as an IT man, if I have a need for high bandwidth for AC for video streaming in a conference room, I might just add one AP of AC and that's an overlay. I'm not going to rip and replace my legacy. Right? I'm going to get more throughput overall, keeping my slow legacy all together and have my power user just on, on the AC by themselves, not having to worry about the 20 megahertz uh, or 40 megahertz client that, that comes into play. So I think, I think it's also fair to understand. We're not necessarily saying that if you want to do this, you're going to do this in every single square inch of the facility with multiple APs. You've got to understand the use case and the application where they need this ability to layer capacity, we give you the ability to do that. Where you don't, and a single channel architecture works for you, you do. You want to mix and match both of those, you do that as well, right? The pic so don't, don't read too much into the picture. The picture is just showing that you have these capabilities. If you really want to take it to that extreme and do it, you can do it. Another point to note, I've been noticing some of the tweets. Another point to kind of also understand is, when we say multi-channels, we don't necessarily mean a microcell architecture, right? And I don't want to go into that because that will be another entire uh, you know, couple of hours spent going through that. But needless to say, keep in mind that a lot of what we do is applicable across the entire spectrum of all the, all the facilities we provide you, the mobile flex. Sounds like a marketing moniker, but essentially that's what it is. It allows you to get some of the benefits of Meru, whether it's a single channel architecture, whether it's a multi-channel architecture, not to be confused with microcell, right? We're just laying out the framework of what is capable or what, what we can actually do, right? Sorry, go ahead. Good, thanks, sir. Well, can, can you just give us 30 seconds on the difference between microcell and multi-channel? Well, you could have potentially, and, and I, I've been told that time is running, but you can have potentially multi single channel to and stacking becomes actually multi channel right so i have multi single channel for the same purpose so that becomes multi channel architecture so, so some of uh, single channels multiple single channels okay. exactly so some of the interesting stuff um, because we were looking at the recent a lot of blog recently and tweet uh, and, and goes with the question you were just saying, can we play well with a 20, interfering, 20 megahertz interfering network? So the folks here just uh, took a couple of 
hours uh, during the last two days and say, well, let, let's do just some quick unofficial initial testing of a client TCP download, 80 megahertz wide, interfering, uh, no interference on the network. And here's the client that we're using, MacBook Air, two single stream, and et cetera. Uh, and, and you get roughly 400 megabits per second of, of download at 80 megahertz. The number is not relevant. What we wanted to see is, wow, OK, if there's another AP from any other you know, manufacturer you want to try, and you actually download with that client interfering at 20 megahertz on the same primary channel as your 80 megahertz, what is the impact? Does it work well together? And, and the result is actually fantastic, in my opinion. The bandwidth goes down to 310. But the effective throughput of that client was roughly 50 megabits per second, 40 to 50. So the overall throughput available on the channel is still just about 40 to 50 megabit less than if you wouldn't have no interference. So you can still play very well, have a very wide channel, 80 megahertz wide, and have another network completely unknown to you that are side by side, and you'll play well with that and offer the total aggregated bandwidth that I think is interesting. So non-scientific again. And then I wanted to do, I, I, I asked if the folks could do that and redo the same test, but with a NAN interfering client. That was an AC interfering client, so we did it with the N. And the N obviously takes a little bit more air time. So you know, the overall throughput is not the same for the N. And, and we, we, they use a little bit air, more air time, so our throughput actually goes down a little bit as well. But it's still within, you know, what, 10? 15% of the uh, overall throughput that you get without any interference. And then I was just putting a number here for reference. If you take just a 40 megahertz channel dual stream, you, you might be getting half of that 400. It's two, 200, 220. But the number, again, is not relevant. It's how well those two networks can play together. It's actually pretty interesting. Some of the uh, interesting feature that we've come out with as well is Bonjour. As you know, Bonjour, especially for us in education, Bonjour exists all over the place. So uh, it, it is a challenging protocol to work with, but it is definitely very efficient for, from a user perspective and convenience. So how does it work? Well, all our APs are actually Bonjour Gateway. So built into your infrastructure, if you have a network that is already up and running and you have APs and controller, right there, you can discover Bonjour device on the wired and on the wireless side anywhere you have an AP. Those AP will discover. You can enforce some policy on what you want the AP to actually allow to, to pass on as a central database. So you consolidate into our controller. And then you redistribute those service. And again, based on some policy, you might redistribute that printer uh, on location in Europe, but you might not do it in, in the US, for example. right? So based on location, based on policies that you can create, user groups, and et cetera, you will redistribute uh, that service and advertise them. So what is a quick use case? Let's just look at two different buildings. I have two SSID, one for student, one for staff. I have my controller somewhere in the network two VLANs, I have a printer in Apple TV in the art building, and another printer in the uh, admin building. I have a faculty members, well, actually, the first thing that will happen, that AP will discover the Apple TV, put that into the database with its location. That next AP will discover the printer, do the same thing, put it in the location in the database. Sure, huh? And finally, that other printer gets detected on a different network and, again, is consolidated in the controller. I might have a use case now where faculty members are allowed, uh, when they're logged in, into the art building to actually see the Apple TV and the local printer, but not the remote printer. Obviously, I want to print locally. But as he moves to the other side, and he's actually in a different location now, I can have that printer, the Bonjour printer, not visible to him, but still the Apple TV. And, and now a local printer is visible is in the Bonjour Is this just done simply by the controller being connected to a trunk link that can see those two VLANs communication? Uh, well, so the discovery is done by the AP. So the, the, obviously, you need to have visibility on all the VLANs that you might have device. So the AP needs to be on a trunk link? Uh, if you want to discover on every single VLAN, yes. Okay. That works? How Good use you, case? How, um, do you have the capabilities of 
blocking access of visibility to absolutely device. absolutely based on group based on ssid based on location you can rebroadcast or not rebroadcast that service and, and even potentially based on time of the day right you you can see where eventually this could evolve where we have rules that based on time of the day or who is accessing you can allow one student for example to broadcast his apple tv for just an hour period so you could enforce right down to that policy but i mean um is it like i can't see it or i'm just not allowed to connect to it uh, you you won't be able to see it, be able to see it. Okay. right and then if I, if I could interrupt what about the ability for um like Apple TVs, they have to be on a non-802.1x network. Sorry, sorry, can you speak up a little bit? They have to be on a non-802.1x network. They don't do enterprise security. <clears throat> they don't store their settings. I mean, they're a, they're a different kind of client, so. If, yeah, for the most part, they're wired, right? A lot of the use case I see, those devices are wired for the teachers and stuff like that, so we discovered them on the wired side, and we just rebroadcast the service on. I'm talking wireless Apple TVs yeah, why because of the security that? issues. So, so maybe we have a, a PM that wants to answer. Do you have a mic, uh, Raj? Yeah, we just because. Uh, well, sorry, we just you're not. You, you just need to come to a mic. Yeah, we, we discover Apple TV on the wireless side as well. So if these can be store on the wireless side. But what I'm saying is, or what I'm asking you to confirm is, Maru does nothing different than anybody else. You still have to put them on a insecure SSID. The Apple TV itself. Yes. Yes. Uh, that depends on the Apple TV. Now, if they right. can do secure authentication, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a that's an Apple TV. That's an Apple question, though. Yeah. That has nothing to do with Maru specific, right? Yeah, I get, yeah. Yeah, so we, we're we not fixing on. anything or changing is, anything. I'm not asking you very well, but I'm I'm asking single SSID to multiple VLANs, the intelligence to take a look at the device and say one SSID. You can go 802.1x, but you have to go here, but. Probably a bigger discussion, so we can move on. Well, it's like it's really an Apple question, Lee. So it's not something that we are enforcing or doing anything on the Apple TV, right? Sure. We support everything that the Apple TV supports. We're just giving you an ability for you to do more with it. Yeah. I know a lot of people may not like Bonjour protocol, right? They may think it's not meant to be in an enterprise. You now have an ability to cut all that. And, and I'm sure you guys are aware there's many, many Apple Bonjour gateway out there, right? Some are freeware, some are gateways that you buy. The key thing here to remember is that this is already part of your infrastructure. It is already part of your wireless deploy today. You simply enable that feature, and now you'll be able to detect uh, Apple throughout worldwide organizations. Now, the last use case, the student comes in, and of course, the student being a, a different group member or a different SSID or a different location, she only gets to see the uh, printer and nothing else. And if she moves to the admin building, she gets to see nothing. So just wanted to show the flexibility overall that exists into our system. Any further question on? Any limitations whether, whether you're doing central data plane or uh, localized data plane? So distributed bridge mode versus, um, yeah, that's sure a pretty good called. question. Do, do, yeah. Does the bonjour? Oh. Yeah, we, we support on both, both planes. Yeah. Lo locally bridge because APs participate in the discovery and that advertisement as well. No feature uh, disparity at all no regardless. No feature disparity at all. Okay. Yeah.